God, we are grateful that through your word you have shown to us your power and your might. Lord, as we gather here for worship, we pray that you would speak to us. Let us not have gathered in vain today. Let us not show up and sing and listen and leave the same. But help us be zealous for good works. Help us to be committed, to be faithful to you, to your word. Help us to walk in obedience that others would know who you are by simply the way we are involving ourselves in their lives. Use us, Lord. Teach us today. Amen. Well, we are in Titus chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I will be out next week uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Junior Little League Regionals, having a great time having people disagree with me on my strike calls and those types of things. So be praying for me. We saved travels 11 hours. Man, that's a long ways to drive, but looking forward to it. And um, Titus in chapter 2, he speaks to us, uh, several groups of people and he calls them out. So there's, there's no like debating like who, who's really you know, Paul trying to write to. First of all, he writes to Titus and then he writes to older men. And if you thought, okay, all the young guys in the room were like, okay, sweet. He's going to get after the old man. Well, guess what? He's, he speaks to us today. So he's speaking to younger men as well. Then he speaks to older women and then younger women. And then finally he speaks to slaves. And so there's several different audiences that Paul is saying, hey, Titus, Here's what I need you to do. Remember, we talked about earlier that Paul left Titus in Crete to establish elders, to establish church leadership for governance, for guidance, for spiritual uh, maturity, and to, to understand, to walk with, with the apostles' teaching and Jesus' teaching. And then he said, said, hey, there's this group of people also you need to be careful of, you know, and they were the, the counter uh, set to what qualifications of an elder. And now we're looking at really this, what is spiritual maturity look like? What, what is he doing here and saying, hey, this is the processes of the people who are knowing and walking with Jesus. So we're going to look at this in chunks. We're not going to read all 15 verses now, but looking at verses one and two, Paul writes in Titus and it says this, but as for you, meaning Titus, teach what accords to sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. He tells Titus, he says, hey, listen, I need you to teach doctrine and teach things that are in accordance to doctrine. You say, what does that really mean, in accordance to doctrine? Well, so there's sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, I, I'm really just trying to discern what God's will is for my life. I don't know if I should take this job opportunity or not. And, you know, it's like, okay, so, you know, where is it at? Well, right now I'm at this company, but I'm thinking about transferring at this job opportunity at USAA, and I'm just not really sure. And I'm like, Look no further. And we pope in the Bible and we look through the concordance in the back and we really find out there's no USAA mentioned anywhere in the Bible. And so we're like, well, I guess the Bible is just silent on how to give us direction and wisdom. I didn't see any of the modern day countries or states we're supposed to move to or what size house we should buy. I don't see any of those square footages defined here in the Bible. So I guess the Bible doesn't speak to those issues. Well, see, the reality is that when he's telling Titus to teach what is accordance to doctrine. He said, there's a lot of things that you're not going to find specifically in the, what the apostles are teaching or what I'm teaching you, but they're in line with what God expects from us. And so teach doctrine, teach what is according to doctrine. Then he says, older men. Now you say, well, who's older men? You know, we talked about, you know, who's the qualification of elder? What does that look like? And we joked and said that would probably be somewhere around the age of 35 or something like that. And uh, just kind of making a, a fun little analogy there. When Jesus started his ministry and when we consider adulthood, we really don't know. But here's what I can tell you. If it's white on top or it's gone, you qualify. If you're not so much there, you might kind of be in that in-between phase. But typically what I look at this is, have you raised your family? I consider yourself an older man. This, just for me particularly, um, Again, you're not going to see that, oh, look, yeah, older men, people who've already raised their families. You're not going to see that written out in the scriptures. But it's, it's what we see here and what we've looked at within uh, Titus chapter 1. So older men, that fits you. You should be sober-minded, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, 
have love and perseverance. Now, in each of these, we're, gonna, we're doing chunks, but in each of these, we're going to pull out a point of emphasis, something I kind of want to highlight on, something I kind of lean on. So older men, point of emphasis there is sound in faith, which really is an equivalent to having an unwavering faith to stand firm on the Word of God, to walk in the Spirit. That you older men, that you would have your heels dug into the Word of God, unwavering in your faith. Now, here's why that's important. You may say, well, pastor, I've already raised my kids. I'm a granddad now. I'm, I'm, I'm retired. I'm just, I'm just on easy street. Can I tell you that your calling through Scripture is to be sober-minded, to have unwavering faith? And here's why. There are younger men that are around you, whether you realize it or not. Some of them are within your own family, and some of them are just in the body of Christ who are looking for guidance. Gone are the days, you, th you think gone are the days where you were uh, parenting and your kids started doing things you did, and you're like, oh, how cute, and then all of a sudden, mom was like, that's why you need to stop doing that. And you're like, okay, sorry, I thought it was funny, and now because you got a kid mimicking and mocking you. Can I tell you something? As a 45-year-old man, there are still men that I look up to. There are men that I admire in the faith. There are people that I say, hey, I need prayer over this. What do you believe about this? Help me grasp. What would you do in this situation? And older men, we, you, we need you to be unwavering in your faith. We need to have your heels dug into the word of God to say, this is what God teaches. This is how I did it wrong. This is how I'm trying to get it right. Or here was a difficult time where I was faithful to the text and this is how God honored that moment. Men, you're time of mentoring is never over until God removes you from this planet or calls you home in the rapture, whatever it may be, your time as a man of God, you need to be unwavering in your faith. And I'm telling you, there are younger men around you who are desperate for men to still stand up and lead and show, hey, this is a wise thing. The second thing I want to point of emphasis is Perseverance. Older men, perseverance, this, this is when we don't, we don't quit or we don't cave just because it got hard or difficult. This is not throw it in the towel. You know what? I've just tried and tried. I'm, I'm done. I just quit. Now, there's a difference in surrendering when it comes to the Lord. That's a good type of quitting. But when it comes to relationships, your family, your faith, older men, please, Show us it's worth it. Persevere. Continue on. Show up even though you're tired. Lead even though you're weary. Bring people along. Have perseverance. He says, Titus, I want you to teach what is according to doctrine. Older men, you need to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, and sound in the faith with love and steadfastness. Perseverance. We don't need to cave or quit because it was hard. As a leader in your family, you're like, I, we've been at this for six months. We've been at this for six years. Can I just encourage you, don't quit. Persevere. Verses 3 through 5, he says this. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine, they are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Older women, to be reverent and to live a life that honors God. It says don't slander. Don't get in your groups and talk negatively about other people. Don't sit around and tear people down in order to make ourselves be better or damage a person's reputation because you feel like it's worth it. Don't drink a lot of wine. Don't drink a lot of alcoholic drinks. Don't, don't make the gathering of what you do about changing the body chemistry. Teach what is good and train younger women to love their husbands and their children. I thought this was kind of a funny thing, like train the younger women to love their husbands. I, I kind of got chuckled just in my, my weird sense of humor because let's be honest, guys, we're weird sometimes. And sometimes if we're honest enough, regardless if we're 20 
or we're 82, we sometimes just slip into these middle school boy moments where we kind of laugh at the silly things and, you know, whatever. And we're like, and our wife's like, seriously? We're like, what? That was funny. And we're like, yeah, if you're 12. And we're like, not when you're 72. And we have these moments. And so I could see, like, an older woman looking at her husband. She's like, he's just going to be dumb sometimes. He's just going to say things that's going to be weird. Love him. Care for him. And trust his leadership. I can just see those kind of, those little, those moments. Just like, hey, you know, now that you're married, um, it doesn't always get better. But he's amazing and God's called you to love and to be a part of him. So train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, work in the home, do good and submit to the husbands. So two points of emphasis on this one. First one is work in the home. I believe there are specific areas where God has gifted and called people to serve. And in the home, I believe the woman plays an irreplaceable role. I don't know how many times growing up, you know, Tony would head to the store or run an errand or something, and something would happen. And I'm like, what is what is like? I want mom. I'm like, well, mom's not here. How can I help you? Like, I'm like, I'm dad. Like, I'll get you chocolate milk. We'll get the Band-Aid. We'll do whatever. We'll have ice cream for dinner. Like, how can I help? And it's like, I just want mom. It doesn't matter what I could offer my kids at the moment. They just wanted their mom. And I believe there are irreplaceable roles in the family and mom's play a huge role in that. <laughs> now, when it says work in the home, you say, well, pastor, does that mean I'm living in a sin if I have a job and my husband has a job? And, you know, is that what that means? There's not a recipe that God gives us that says, hey, if you do these things, your kids will turn out perfectly. You won't ever have any turmoil in the family. There is no promise and guarantees on earth. But what I will tell you is I believe the investment time is necessary within the family. And if we are working so hard to provide things that we think the kids want, and it takes away from our time to actually be present with our kids, then I, I feel like th there may be a conversation that could take place within your home if you feel that. I'm not here to tell you how to, where to work and where to live and how much money to make, and I'm not here to tell you all those things, but I do know that there are irreplaceable roles within the home. And Titus says, encourage, encourage the, the, the older women to teach the younger women to, to, to find their place and to serve and love their families within the home. For Tanya and I, there were seasons where she worked and the seasons where she didn't work. There were times that she uh, worked in the daycare because that's where our, our kids were. That was kind of their age and that was a way to help provide some extra income for us. And then there was a time when they moved on to elementary school and she got her teaching certification. She worked in the, in, in the school system and we could have the same schedules and we could be around the kids and and now she isn't a teacher and she's, you know, doing different things that allow us to still continue to be present with our family. And there'll be seasons of life that you go through, but it's important that we don't sacrifice the time with the kids for things for the kids. Because no matter what we can provide them materialistically, what they really need is mom and dad. And if we're so busy in the world that we forget the home, then we may be sowing things that we don't want to reap later on. The other thing, it says submit to their husbands. And you're thinking, oh, gosh, Paul, you're, you're really hammering the ladies today. Actually, let me say it this way. When it comes to submit your husbands, people don't mind following good leadership. You look around for people, and they will follow a good leader. Without question, without hesitation. You have a boss and they say, man, we just love working for this company. Man, they, they do a great job the, the way they give their holidays, the way, they, the way, they, the way the, they pay people, the way they treat their employees. We just love working for this place because they will follow good leadership. So rather than husbands lead from a place of title, well, the Bible says you've got to follow me, then I'm the head of the household. Let me ask you, husbands a question. Are you being a good leader? Are you worthy of being followed? It's not wives submit to your husbands, but also husbands, are you living a life worthy of followership? Are you leading by a title? Or are you leading by example? Are you leading through humility? Or are you leading, well, the Bible says you're supposed to submit to me, you're supposed to obey me, you're supposed to do these things. People will follow good leadership. You don't have to tell people to follow you if you're leading them well. And you don't have to remind them that you're the boss if you're leading them well. So yes, wives submit to your husbands. But husbands, really? The question is, are we leading well? Are we setting an example 
that our families want to follow our leadership. They're willing to follow our leadership. You know, on that same note, wives, kids, sometimes you can catch a lot more honey, or a lot more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. My grandma used to always tell me that, and finally I realized what it was. And this last week, I spent the, the, the last part of the week at Abilene at the State Little League Tournament. And you know what I did not hear from the stands? I heard a lot of things, but here's what I didn't hear. At the softball tournament, I didn't hear, hey, Susie, guess what? You're over for four today, so why don't you just quit? You haven't swung a bat well. You haven't made contact with the ball all tournament long. Ask the coach to pull you out of the lineup. Hey, you're out in the field. Remember, use that leather thing on your hand because you didn't use it last inning because guess what? The ball went right by in the outfield and there was a run scored and we lost the game. Susie, come on, pick it up. I never heard that. Although I'll tell you, not the girl named Susie, but there was a girl that's exactly like that that was on a game. She struck out every single time she came up the plate and every time the ball was hit to her at second base, she never once made a play on it. You know what I heard from the stands every time? Hey, you got this. I know it's 0-2, there's no one better. You can do this, keep your head down, swing hard. You got it. We believe in you. Your team needs you. You've got this. All I heard was encouragement from some, to someone that hasn't performed all game long. And sometimes in the home, it's, well, you didn't do this right, and you messed this up. And last time you said this, this was going to happen, this would happen. And can I tell you, sometimes we as men, whether we'll like to admit it or not, we just need a little bit of encouragement. So wives, can I just encourage you to be your husband's biggest cheerleader? I told you at the beginning of the service, that was a rough week. Had a lot going on, personally, emotionally, scheduling-wise, those, those types of things. Going into this sermon, preparing, being out of town, different things like that. I was just, I just feel like I'm, I'm, I'm leading with a limp today. I'm leading off balance. I even told the praise team and the staff when we met, I said, I'm just, I'm in a fog. I'm like, I'm not quite there. I'm just trusting that God will use me today, that I'll be faithful to the text. My wife sent me the, the sweetest prayer of encouragement today. I said, I just need some help. I need you to pray for me. To know that our spouses can be our biggest cheerleaders. It's necessary. So older women, teach your, these younger women how to, how to love their husbands, how to love their children. You've been through those seasons of life. You've been where that moment where it's like, I don't know if we're going to make it through this weekend. And then you know what? Guess what? You made it through the weekend, and now you're celebrating 50 years. There are other women in the church right now wanting to know if they're going to make it through year 12. And they need to know that these other women are going to teach them. And say, you know what? <laughs> I remember that. I was ready to pack up and move back to my parents' house, but here's what we did. And here's how God worked in that moment. Older women teach the younger men to love their husbands and their children, submit to their husbands, to have a place of work in the home that is irreplaceable. Verses 6 through 8, Paul writes and he says this, Likewise, Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity. And sound speech that cannot be condemned, that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Young men, live wisely. You say, well, who are the young men now? You, you, you told us who the older men were. Who are the younger men? If you haven't started your family or finished your family, you've not, they've not all moved out. So from four years old to whoever that is, today I want to encourage you to live wisely. Yes, Bennett, live wisely. <laughs> he heard me talking about him. Live wisely. Be self-controlled. This example should be followed by the older men. That's why it's important for men that you live a life that is self-controlled. Because younger men need to know what that looks like. And they're going to look up, and they're going to look out, and they're going to see what that looks like for them. Live a self-controlled life. Paul encourages Titus to be a good example, to have integrity in his teachings, so that he can't be criticized. And when someone says, hey, you're not this, or you're not that, that they will actually be put to shame as a result. So what's our point of emphasis for the younger men? This one. 
Younger men, be self-controlled. You don't have to have it all, and you don't have to have it all right now. So the biggest mistakes I made in my, in my younger years was the fact that I felt like I had to do everything that I saw everyone around me doing, but I could not do it because it's taken them 30 years to get there, and I was only on year one. Be self-controlled. You don't have to scratch every itch that you have. Every desire, every thought that process, everything that comes through your mind, you don't have to go after it. Show and demonstrate self-control. If you have, if you pursue every desire you have, you will run out of energy and you won't be focused. And if you were, those, any of those desires were to be sexual, I just want to encourage you to flee. Show self-control. I can assure you, young men, that being self-controlled at a young age pays out huge later on in life. And any older man here would stand up and testify that that's true. Because there's different mistakes and different things and habits maybe that were created at a young age that they wish they weren't battling at an old age. And had they just demonstrated some self-control and surrounded themselves with people who would pour into them, that self-control at a young age would pay out huge later on the older age. Verses 9 through 10. He says, Bond servants, you're to be submissive to their, your own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they might adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Slaves were to be submissive, well-pleasing, which means seeking to please. Not argumentative, pilfering, which means setting things aside for yourself. Um, here I am sorting all these things, but I'm going to keep these four for mine and put the rest over here for everyone else. We're going to kind of take what is, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of this, but I'm going to keep a couple for me because I, I want to do that. And he says, showing or demonstrating good faith, which means being trustworthy. Adorn the doctrine. Show others the beauty of what it means to follow Christ. So what's the point of emphasis? Showing all good faith. This means being trustworthy. This doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you've not messed up. Doesn't mean you, you, you're, you're giving advice and you haven't always taken that same advice yourself every single time. You've, you've had some trip ups, you've had some failures. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but what it means is you're living a life that's worthy of trust. Now, we don't have slaves today. So this would equate more to like an employee boss situation. For those of us who work for someone, what is, how do our employees identify us? When a new company, when a new guy shows up in the company, they're like, oh, this is, this is Paul, he's in charge of whatever. How do they describe you to that new person in the company? Do they describe you as someone you gotta kinda keep an eye out for, don't share too much with them or everyone else in the office will know? Or they look at you and say, this guy, this person is worthy of trust. They, I, I, would, I give them the keys to my car. They've got my, the gate code to my, my house. I trust them with everything. How do they describe you to the other people that you are around? We should show, have good faith. In Christ, do we, good, demonstrate, do we demonstrate to him faith by following in obedience? Yes. And we demonstrate this by the things he's entrusted us to, our families, our jobs, our friendships. And we show ourselves of good faith to him by being, by being obedient and trustworthy with the things he has entrusted to us. In the workplace, to be known for as a Christ follower, to be known for as a, as a Christian. But we know him as being trustworthy. 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce the ungodliness, the world passions, to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life at the present age, awaiting our blessed hope of the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for the redeem us for the all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions who are zealous for good work. God's grace was demonstrated through Jesus bringing salvation to who? All people. Jesus brought salvation to all people, and Jesus showed us what it looked like to live a life of, that renounces ungodliness, a life that renounces the worldly passions, to live a life of self, being self-controlled, upright. Jesus showed us what it looked like to live a life that honors 
God. So, what's the point of emphasis? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. We gather each week for worship, hopefully not out of habit, but for purpose. We don't show up because it's Sunday and, well, you know, it's probably not best to start on the yard till the afternoon. And, well, you know, we don't really like to cook on Sunday, so we'll just go out. So it just makes sense to go to church, eat out, and then we'll start on the yard work. And that's kind of why we go to church because it just kind of fills that gap on a Sunday morning. You really don't know what else to do. No. We don't gather out of habit. We gather for a purpose. We say, Bulverde Baptist Church, we exist for people to belong in community, grow in a relationship with Jesus, and invest in the lives of others. And that's why we're here. We want people to know the belong to this community. That the younger women have someone to look up to to be taught with, by the older women. And that the older women are, are taking their job and their role seriously and discipling and caring for the you know, younger ladies in, in the congregation. And I know what people say, well, no one's ever come to me. No one's ever, I'm, I'm willing if someone just come to me. C- can, I, can I tell you? That's like me saying I'm willing to feed the homeless if someone just knock on my door. I probably would be willing. But how are they going to know that I'm a place where the need can be met unless I let people know I'm willing to meet your need. Maybe it's not just good enough to sit there and say, I'm willing. Maybe it's, it's willingness to say, hey, Paul, here's my phone number. Here's my email address. If you ever encounter someone that needs someone to come alongside them, I want you to call me. Reaching out to our women's ministry and saying, you know what? I'm going to go on the next women's retreat. I'm going to get involved in a women's Bible study. And I'm not just going to show up and just feed off the information there, but I'm going to get around and involve myself with people and rub elbows with people because I want to belong in community. I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus. I want to help someone else grow in their relationship with Jesus by investing myself into their life. I know what some of the people are thinking. I, I don't, I'm not that good of a teacher. I don't have that many good things to say. I'm not that smart a person. I'm not a Bible scholar. Can I just be honest, as someone who's been young in the ministry for years, I was never looking for a Bible scholar. I was never looking for someone per- that perfect. I was really just looking for someone to play golf with and talk. I was really looking for someone just to hang out with and, and talk hunting. And then every once in a while also talk about what it's like to raise teenage kids. What I really wanted to do was just kind of go hang out with someone and then be like, hey, by the way, what do you think about this? And just feed off the wisdom that is there. I wasn't always looking for someone to sit down and do a dissertation and walk through me step by step of what it means to, to do X, Y, and Z. I just needed someone who showed they cared about me. And when I knew they cared about me, then I could trust them with something going on in my life. Verse 15. Paul says, declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. Point of emphasis, it's good for us to declare and remind ourselves of these practical truths. We need to encourage and rebuke one another. It's easy to point out someone's faults. It's harder to walk beside them through those difficult times. It's easy to look at someone and say, you know what, don't worry, it'll get better. You know, next week, we'll, you know, pick your head up. Next week's a new, a new day. It's more difficult to say, you know what, the reason why you're in this situation is because you're reaping what you're sowing. You've neglected your marriage for so long, and this is why your marriage is not healthy right now. It's a whole easier to say, you know what, just take her some roses. Take her, take her out to eat, tell her you love her, tell her she looks pretty, and, and she'll forget all that other stuff. And it'll be, you know, That's the easy thing to do. The hard thing is to say, you know what, this may be the fruit of poor leadership. And he says, you need to exhort. You need to rebuke. We're called to do hard things for one another. And that's why we need to be in community. So we can have people who we trust and we love that come alongside of us to care for us. So in your notes, in your bulletin real quickly, we're going to go through four key ingredients what I think require our requirements for maturity. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to walk with Christ. We're trying to mature in Christ. And we're hoping that six months from now, we're stronger in our faith. And then six years from now, we're stronger than we were back then. And that we're growing. And we're going to encounter challenges and trials and tribulations that God is going to you know, lead us through to strengthen our faith. To have perseverance. And the first thing I think this a key ingredient for maturity is discipleship. Older men, older women, if you've never discipled anyone, I don't know if you would be more mature, it's maybe I would say more knowledgeable. Because maturity is really pouring yourself into someone so that that person can be a better version 
of where you were at that time. Discipleship looks like putting, letting other people's floor be your ceiling. So I'm going to bring you along to the point because, man, if somebody poured into me when I was 25, this is where I'd be. Instead, I didn't learn that until I was 45. And so I want every 25-year-old to know what I now know at 45 so they will be smarter, wiser, and be able to move forward. Discipleship is key for maturity. If you're not discipling someone, you've not been discipled, I'm telling you, you're missing out a key component in maturity. If you're just attending church, you're gaining knowledge. But discipleship is what we're called to do, to mentor, to care, to train, and to teach. Second thing is this, to be self-controlled. Maturity, self-controlled is a a great ingredient of maturity. If you say that person is mature in Christ, you would see self-control demonstrated. If we continue to let our thought bubble become our speech bubble, we probably lack a little self-control. When we turn to a substance to control our emotions or actions, we probably lack a little self-control. When sin knocks at our door and presents ourselves with an opportunity and we don't say no, we probably lack self-control. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There's no sin that we are ever encountered with. We are a defeated foe. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. That's what the scripture tells us. If we are walking in a sin and choosing to do things our own, it's because we are choosing to live in rebellion against the the power what the Holy Spirit has given us to choose differently. And God says in, in his word, he says, I've given you an opportunity to escape when sin attacks. The question is, will you choose the opportunity or will you be prey to the sin that's before you? Self-control. An example of maturity. When sin knocks on the door, say, you know what? That may seem like a really good decision and it may seem like I, re- I really want, but I know this is what God's word has called me to do. And this is the opportunity for my, to get myself out of that situation and walk in righteousness. Third ingredient of spiritual maturity is obedience in Christ. Well, this is kind of a really big ingredient. It's kind of like making cookies without using flour. I know some of you gluten people are yelling at me right now. You're like, you can do it. You know, I, I get it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a key ingredient. When he provides a way out, are we going to walk in obedience with it? Or will we rebel against it? Because that's really what it is. It's not about, well, I just, you know, it's just, I just it's the habit. It's just whatever. No, it's It's rebellion. We know what God's word has said, and we're choosing to rebel against what God has called us to be. And so therefore, I'm rebelling against his voice, and so I'm not really being obedient in Christ. And maybe because we're lacking a little boldness, which is the fourth ingredient. Boldness is the fourth ingredient. Are we willing to take steps in faith, not having the assurance that everything's going to be successful? You know, a lot of times we say, God, guarantee me this isn't going to be hard before I do it. It's not always going to be the case. Are we willing to walk through it just because we know we're being obedient to the Holy Spirit? Are we being bold enough to say, I don't know what the outcome will be, but I do know I'm going to be obedient in the process. Sometimes this boldness looks like stepping out of your comfort zone for evangelism and saying, you know what, I don't know if I've ever asked this person if they, what they believe about Jesus. So, so I'm just going to do the, the, what I call the holy countdown. I'm just going to do it. Three, two, one. Hey, what do you believe about Jesus? And just, there it is. I just blurted it out and now we're having the conversation. Maybe, maybe it's in that area of evangelism. You just say, you know what, I, I don't know where this person stands. I don't know who they are in Jesus. I don't know what they believe about him. And so you just have to be bold and do things and say things outside your comfort zone. Or maybe it uh, looks like telling someone to stop in a sin that you know that they're living in. Regardless of how they may have justified it, regardless of the reasons they engage in it. You, you know that this is not a healthy area in your life, and you know it's hurting, and you don't know how to, to navigate that, and so maybe it, it requires maturity is being bold and say, hey, I, I love you enough to tell you that this isn't healthy. And, and you know what? You may say, well, I don't want to have a strange friendship out of that deal. That, that may happen. But the boldness to say, this is not right, and I wish you would stop. Sometimes it looks like brokenness. This boldness to have a maturity takes, it's, it, we're maturing in Christ when we're willing to admit 
that we're being chained to sin and that we want help. It's like when we, when we do this because we know that, that being chained to the sin is eating away at the gifts and the blessings that God has planned for us. But it's what we've known and no one's taught us any different and we lack self-control and sometimes we just need to, as we mature in Christ, be bold enough to say, I need help. My relationship with my kid is, they don't, they don't want to talk to me. They won't return. I walk in the room and say, hey, how's it going? And they, they don't even take their headphones out and acknowledge I'm there. And I, I just don't know how to do this. I need help. My marriage is struggling. I'm struggling with my finances. Whatever it may be, sometimes it's just the maturity process you're in. It's, it's boldness admitting that you're really weak and that you need help. These four ingredients, discipleship, self-control, being self-controlled, obedience, and boldness. They're not the only ingredients in the maturity process, but they're big ones. And we see Paul telling Titus here, he's like, older women, do this. Younger women, do this. Older men, do this. Younger men, do this. Those that are slaves, those who have masters, do this. And by the way, we're all slaves. We're slaves to Christ. He is the master. And we obey his commands. And we're not going to take the things that he is entrusted with and pilfer and kind of keep things for ourselves we're going to entrust and do things as the master has called us to do and that we be known as trustworthy stewards as children of god so where are we at what is where we at in the maturity process are we maturing in christ do we come to church for a purpose or we come to church because of habit I pray that we would be a church that would come to church and we'd have function in what we do, that we would have purpose in what we do, and we would want to get closer to Christ, and sometimes that means getting rid of ourselves a little more. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for today. I pray you would guide us, you would teach us, help us be good stewards of what you entrusted with us, not materialistically, but just being faithful to our friendships, faithful in our families, faithful in the things you have entrusted to us, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all things. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing before you're dismissed. This morning, he is our living hope. Before we're dismissed and we read Ephesians 2.10, I want to remind you that we have our quarterly business meeting as soon as we're done with the service. It shouldn't take longer than 10, 15 minutes, but I would encourage you for those church members to stick around, see where we are uh, financially as a church. You get a copy of that. Um, and also we got a, a couple things we need to vote on and approve of. But for everyone else or all of us, let's read Ephesians uh, 2.10 and, and remind us that we're being sent this week. It says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And just like Titus said, that we would be zealous for good works. I hope that we as Bull Verde Baptist Church, when we go into the work week, we go into Monday or even this afternoon, that we would be excited to see what God has prepared for us to walk in. And we would be zealous about it. Church, if we can do anything for you, pray with you about anything, we'll have some deacons down front. I'm going to get some things squared away for our business meeting, which is going to start here in about five minutes. But for all of us, remember, we're sent to walk in the good works that God has for us. Have a wonderful week.